Welcome to iDream of Indie, everyone. Rogue Hearts here with you today with a PlayStation 5 console review for JRPG Edge of Eternity from French developer Midgar Studio. If you want me to reveal Alpharius's whereabouts, you will have to let me scrutinize your soul first. That's what I figured. If you're unfamiliar with this title, it originally started out as a project on Kickstarter where it successfully met and surpassed its budget goals. Released on Steam in June of 2021, the game is now coming to consoles for the first time with all the latest game updates as well as a new feature, Japanese voiceovers. Billed as an indie tribute to the JRPG genre, the game takes place in a world of crystals, magic, and alien technology. If these things sound familiar to fans of the Final Fantasy series, rest assured that this is not an accident. The game wears its inspiration from those titles without the slightest bit of shame. This is immediately noticeable once you take control of main character Darian, an army scout who bears an uncanny resemblance to Noctis from Final Fantasy XV. It's almost as if developers commissioned Nomura himself to design him. I say this not as a critique, however, because as mentioned, the developers make it clear what the game is intended to be, a love letter to those classic JRPGs of yore. Taking place on the continent of Harrion, Darian is eventually joined by his priestess sister Selene after a brief introduction that introduces players to the world's antagonists, the Archelites, an alien and technologically advanced race that seeks to mine the planet of its crystals, which imbue their possessor with magical abilities and hold mysterious powers. Darian, now an army deserter, sets off with sister Selene to seek out a cure for their mother who suffers from the corrosion, aka the metal sickness an affliction that poisons the body and morphs the victim from human into a human-machine hybrid. It's a relatively unremarkable background story, and in my opinion the weakest aspect of this game. It's compounded by the fact that neither of the siblings is all that interesting from a personality perspective. I never really felt an emotional connection to either character, nor did I ever really get a good grasp on their personalities. Darian in particular is kind of an awkward character with dialogue that bounces between nonsensical reactions and basically just being a total jerk. He was totally unlikable for me from a personality perspective which is a problem when you're investing in an adventure with this character. He's basically Squall from Final Fantasy VIII without any of the depth or charm. Selene fares a little bit better and seems a bit more fleshed out, but also isn't that interesting, and the back and forth sibling banter between her and Darian seems incredibly forced. Fear not, however, as it isn't all bad news regarding this game. In fact, I would say there's more good than bad here on the whole, but the storyline and characters you encounter are certainly underwhelming, if not disappointing, which sometimes left me struggling for motivation to continue. Luckily, there's the gameplay. The battles are turn-based and use the ATB, or Active Time Battle, system made famous in the Final Fantasy series of JRPGs. Battles take place on a grid-light hexagonal playing field, where you can issue commands to your character to move around from grid to grid. This becomes strategic as combat advances, because you'll often need to use the battlefield to your advantage. Certain grids will harbor large crystals on them that will either enhance your character stats or cause harm. Enemies also perform grid-specific attacks, so you'll want to move to safety to avoid big damage. Replacing the standard JRPG cursor menu, you instead issue commands using the L2 and R2 triggers respectively, with one trigger for standard commands such as fight, run, or skip turn slash defend, and the other reserved for your magic attacks, with particular magics exploiting enemy weaknesses. I found the battle system to be incredibly enjoyable and satisfying, although it can get a bit cumbersome or confusing on occasion, especially as you learn more and more magic attacks. But on the whole, it's brilliantly done and makes for strategic and satisfying combat. Each battle also gives the player opportunity to earn bonuses by completing a battle objective. An example of this objective might be kill the marked enemy last or perform a behind the back attack. It's a nice little incentive and helps to really force the player to strategize a bit more than they might have, even if it's entirely optional. Difficulty is adjustable, but I found the default setting to be just about right. I was dying just enough to make me not get frustrated, while also feeling like I earned each victory. I greatly enjoyed the battle system in this game and honestly preferred it to the more recent offerings from the much bigger budget Final Fantasy games. It was that good. The game also utilizes an upgrade system similar to that of the Materia system in Final Fantasy VII that allows you to improve your character stats while also unlocking different magical spells and abilities. In Edge of Eternity this is done with the crystal upgrade system where you collect, purchase, or create crystals that you then plug into a grid in the character menu that contains branching paths, each with its own respective stat bonuses. The amount of slots available in your grid are tied to how upgraded your current weapon is and with more crystal slots unlocking as your weapon levels up. There are some other gameplay elements thrown in for good measure as well, including weapon and armor crafting, but these aren't all that complex, and armor crafting in particular seemed a bit unnecessary. I always found better armor in the field or as quest rewards. Yes, there are side quests as well, but mostly fetch quests and tasks that add little to the story. Weapon crafting, however, I found to be a bit more satisfying and necessary. Weapons and armor are essentially crafted on benches and towns using items you've collected exploring. Moving on to presentation and graphics, Edge of Eternity offers a very mixed bag here. Graphically, there are moments of brilliance and awe, followed by moments of ugliness and disappointment. Knowing how small the team was that created this game, I am far more apt to be lenient than I would be were it a AAA developer, but there are some issues that are hard to overlook. Low-res textures, pop-in, frame rate drops, and stuttering happen a bit more often than I would have liked, but there are also some absolutely beautiful environments in this title, and times where it runs without a hitch. 
These times are typically relegated to the more linear, less open world areas, unfortunately, as the game does struggle a bit in the larger environments. The game gives the player two graphical options on console, one focusing on performance and the other focusing on graphical fidelity. I personally chose to play the majority of this game in performance mode, as to my untrained eye, I didn't see a huge improvement graphically in the other mode, outside of a resolution bump, and with so much of this game taking place in an open world-like environment, it was much easier to enjoy in performance mode. And enjoy it I truly did. The art direction in the world building is beyond commendable. It does feel like a living, breathing alien world that we get to explore, be it on foot or riding on the back of our trusty Nekaru, the game's answer to the Chocobo. Lush vegetation, epic skylines, and sprawling landscapes are a plenty in Edge of Eternity, with an excellent variety of environments to experience. You'll see snow and you'll see smog-covered streets, you'll see brilliant starry skies, and you'll see mysterious and futuristic cityscapes. It's certainly a strength of this game, and often I'd find myself whiling away my minutes just running around taking in the sights. The character models are a bit inconsistent, however, and I felt most of the designs here were somewhat uninspired, particularly compared to the environmental wonders in the game. Graphically, a lot of the NPCs are pretty bland and low res, with little variety. Again, there's probably more good than bad here, and I really take my hat off to Midgar Studio for what they were able to accomplish with their small team. Now, perhaps, I move on to my biggest disappointment. Let me preface this by saying that my disappointment here stems solely from my own immense expectations. Once I heard Yasunori Mitsuda was going to compose music for this title, I struggled to contain my joy. This is the man who composed some of the most universally and personally beloved RPG soundtracks of all time, with a resume that includes Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, and Xenogears. It's also no secret the toll composing some of these soundtracks took on him personally, but the result is undeniably some of the most beautiful and memorable video game compositions ever written. Needless to say, I went into this review with high hopes for what I was about to hear through my speakers. The final verdict? It's... pretty okay. Mostly though, it's just kind of blah and incredibly inconsistent, both in terms of quality and in terms of cohesiveness. Don't get me wrong, it's perfectly suitable and works well within the game's storyline and world, but it's not particularly memorable. There's no standout tracks, and it mostly just ended up feeling like repetitive background music. Of course, it's bound to get repetitive in any RPG eventually, but there's nothing here that even would get stuck in my head. No earworm. I hear it and it's familiar again, but then I forget about it when the game is off. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention fellow soundtrack composer Cedric Menendez, whose contributions deserve to be acknowledged as well. Again, there's nothing wrong at all with the soundtrack, it's probably even good, but I think when you have a pedigree of Mitsuda and use it as a selling point, it's fair to expect a bit more. The Japanese voiceovers, however, are not disappointing. In fact, I found myself playing the game entirely with the Japanese cast of actors, and found them preferable to the English ones, which bordered on cringe on occasion. There were some incredibly wooden performances with the English actors, but I found that not to be an issue with the Japanese performances. This aspect makes for a worthy addition to the game. Edge of Eternity is marketed as a tribute to the classic JRPGs we all know and love. I think in this regard, it's a massive success. It does a wonderful job of paying tribute to the gameplay, battle systems, and character advancement features of those now classic titles. Indeed, it may even surpass some of the more contemporary JRPG offerings in this aspect. It's clear a lot of blood, sweat, passion, and tears went into this title. However, in this ambition, I think perhaps something was missed along the way that made all those great classic JRPGs so special. Heart. Our emotional connection to the characters and to the story and the world is a huge aspect of why we keep going back to those games. Why we get goosebumps when we think about Aerith and Yuna. The connection we felt with Chrono, Marley, and Luca even though Chrono never says a word. The emotion of Squall and Renoa's embrace in the field of flowers. This game offers none of that connection, unfortunately. Even though it has everything else, Darien and Selene's adventure was a means to an end and nothing more. And that's unfortunate because everything that happened around it was great. From a combat perspective, this was one of the most fun RPGs I've ever played. I say that sincerely, I just wish I enjoyed the ride as much as I could have. That said, I do recommend this game. There's too much good here to ignore if you're a fan of JRPGs. Just don't expect to feel magic, as all you're going to get is nostalgia instead. And maybe that's not a bad thing. On the edge of eternity, stand ever fast. <laughs> Let's now take a moment to thank all the great indie warriors who keep the blood pumping to our indie heart. Bill T, Christian Cruz, Kevalo, Mitchell Hall, Chris Jackson, Nathan Moore, Adriana Amato, CJR, C. Coyle, Skeptism, Hallie, Julian Kalbus, Jen Rose, Jesse, CPM, Bunny, JRS8, Raylan, Marky Mint, Dave Harp, Peekaboo, Lex Noyle, Eric, PSC, King of the Hatch, Carmen Red, Larkison. Without you, our indie dreams would never come true, so thank you all for your continued support of the channel. If you're interested in supporting I Dream of Indie, please check out the description box below for some options on how to do that. 